Stanford University. Welcome to tonight's Cafe Scientifique at Stanford Blood Center. My name is Kevin O'Neill in the Marketing and Communications Department. Stanford Blood Center is part of the Pathology Department within the Stanford School of Medicine. It is the primary supplier of blood products to Stanford Medical Center, which is the second largest user of blood products in our nation, as well as to four other major hospitals in our community. Of the approximately 70 blood centers in the United States, only two are considered to be academic community blood centers, Stanford Blood Center being one of the two. The academic facet of our mission has been a springboard for many milestones and industry-leading discoveries made here. Our success would not have been possible without our faithful blood donors, many of whom are here this evening. Thank you very much. This evening, we are privileged to have as our speaker, Professor Michael Snyder. Professor Snyder is a professor in the Stanford School of Medicine's genetics department. He also serves as chair of the department. He earned his BA in chemistry and biology at the University of Rochester and his PhD in biology at Caltech. Was it in biology? Because I couldn't find out. It was. It was, okay, all right, make sure of that. He served on the faculty of the biology department at Yale University from 1986 to 2009, prior to coming to Stanford, a change he's glad he made. <laughs> His research touches a variety of topics in genetics, including mapping transcriptional factor binding networks, analyzing individual and species level differences in DNA sequences and regulatory elements, and using genetics to understand the molecular basis of disease. He is a member of BioX, the Child Health Research Institute, the Stanford Cancer Institute, and the Stanford Neurosciences Institute. Last month, he was awarded a three-year, $7 million grant from the National Human Genome Research Institute to study how genetic regulatory elements control the maturation of skin cells. Professor Snyder, will be inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences this fall. His most recent research discovery involved the finding that autism may be linked to a defect in communication between the two halves of the brain. This evening, Professor Snyder will share the details of his autism-related discoveries, among other uh, insights on autism. Please welcome Professor Snyder. Great. Well, thanks very much for having me here. I am going to tell you about autism, mostly from the genetic side, because that's actually where our area of expertise is. And it's a relatively new area for us, and so I may wind up learning as much from you as I hope you learn from us. So basically, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on autism. I'm going to talk about genomics and big data for trying to analyze complex diseases. And then I want to talk about how we can bring some of the expertise in our area to try and gain new insights into autism research. Uh, and, and uh, autism itself. So I think most of you appreciate autism is an incredibly heterogeneous disease, uh, from very mild, very, very severe, to certain kinds of characteristics, other kinds of characteristics. It's uh, many different characteristics, and I you can't read them all up here, but uh, they all involve some degree of socialization or behavioral aspects. And again, they're, they're very distinctive for different kids. And they're often, um, I should say, different people in general. And I can also say that there are other defects besides behavioral defects associated with autism. Um, there can be you know, differences in size of head, either big or small. And in general, it's just been a very complex disease and one that's been very, very difficult to get one's hands around. And in fact, I think the way most people think about this is that it's really a spectrum of disease, not one single disease that makes this, it's probably a combination of many different diseases. And I don't think this is any different from probably most other diseases like type 2 diabetes or schizophrenia or such. And I think it's going to be important to be able to understand these diseases as their particular sub-diseases, in my opinion. And so I think being able to characterize them for their different um, aspects is going to be ultimately important for, first of all, being able to diagnose early and then ultimately treating these diseases. So um, I think many of you appreciate autism is, autism is in the, on the rise. So just in the last decade alone, it went from 1 in 90 to 
1 in 68, and I don't think most people think that all of this is due to increased diagnosis. Some may be, but probably not all of it. And in fact, some people estimate that it's gone up as much as 60-fold since the 1960s. So it's really gone up a huge amount, and the reason for this is really not clear at all. Um, there, um, I think many of you appreciate that for, um, at least in the case of children, if you can diagnose a disease early, in many cases you can modify um, the behavior and, and uh, improve uh, the socialization and behavior of the children. And these are just some facts that are up there, which is that um, children that are very, very young, under 18 months, can benefit the most uh, in a decent number, but not all. In more severe cases, it's very difficult to do much with. But 20 to, it's estimated that 20 to 50 percent, you can actually have copies of these slides if you like at the end, so you don't have to shoot pictures here. But as many as 20 to 50 percent of kids uh, receiving early intervention ultimately can move into mainstream schools. And, and of course, that's very useful. Uh, they're by, uh, recognize that these are subjective matters, but their IQ can go up as high as 17 points on average. Uh, and from an economic standpoint, this can be a hugely beneficial as well. Um, and in fact, you see the th last statistic here. Uh, the cost of lifelong care can be reduced considerably, again, if you simply catch the disease and intervene early. Uh, now, the way it typically works, though, unfortunately, is that many cases, perhaps most cases, are diagnosed very late, age four or so, when it's often very difficult. You can still modify behavior many kids, but not all. And again, it gets increasingly difficult as children get older and older. Uh, and part of the reason is that people often see some initial concern, perhaps early on, then they kind of watch this out, and then they see a specialist, and it just doesn't, the whole process is very, very slow, and it's not a very efficient process. And there are people actually working on this. For example, Dennis Wall, who's here at, uh, at Sanford, I'll mention this at the end, because we've set up a collaboration with him, and that might be a fun area to discuss. But he actually takes videos of kids, and in a five-minute video you can shoot with an iPhone, he can make some predictions about whether your child is more likely to be autistic or not with a pretty good uh, prediction measure. So it actually works pretty, pretty well. Uh, and so really, uh, I think what we need to be able to do is diagnose the disease early, um, and uh, especially before four years old, and try and modify behaviors, again, so that we can have maximized impact. Now, the underlying ca causes of autism, again, are probably very heterogeneous. But it is clear, as we'll talk about more in a minute, that there is a strong genetic component to this. So genetics is a huge factor for autism. But exposure is a big deal as well, the so-called uh, environmental exposure or exposomes, so all the various things that someone might be exposed to. And a lot of this is thought to, in fact, occur very early, possibly uh, as early as, as uh, during pregnancy. So fetus in the womb, and some people have, in fact, argued it's actually it's the uh, fetus actually that can pass it on to their child. So it's actually when the eggs are first forming in the fetus. So it could, could be very, very early stage events. Uh, but certainly there's a lot of evidence. And there's also some evidence that post-birth environmental factors can, can be important as well. Now how much is genetics and how much is environment still is not very well understood. Uh, some early studies suggested as much as 90% of, of autism was due to genetics. That, clearly isn't the case, I would say, these days. A landmark study here from Stanford uh, in Joachim Hallmeyer's lab, looking at twins, suggested that about 38% uh, of the effect of autism is due to genetics and another 62%. And then there's a study in Sweden that very, looking at very large numbers of people, you can see hundreds of thousands of, of related and unrelated individuals have estimated that basically the, um, the heritability, the genetic aspect of autism may be on the order of 50%. Um, I wouldn't take these numbers too overly seriously because, again, this is Sweden and particularly European population and could vary depending where you live and such. But the point is it is a combination of genetics and environment that's probably contributing this disease. And that may be true even at the individual level. That is, when a person gets autism, it may be because they are genetically predisposed as well as have been uh, exposed to the you know, particular environmental factors that may be contributing to this. And again, so it's probably a combination of both. Now, just because of our background, 
uh, and I think the things that we tend to be pretty good at, we've been mostly pursuing the genetic angle. And I'm not saying that's a solution. It's just, a, if you will, to me, it's an entry into trying to better understand the disease. And I think if we can understand some of the underlying frameworks for autism, we'll ultimately be able to classify it better and treat it better. That's how our lab is viewing this whole area. Um, and so what we've been trying to do is get at the underlying genetics. Now, typically, um, these days, uh, it used to be there were more um, ways of trying to understand genetic basis by something called genotyping, where you would look at a few markers around, the, around in someone's DNA. And these days, many of you may know, you can actually sequence an entire genome pretty easily. Uh, and that's because the cost of genome sequence, the cost of getting your DNA sequenced, has dropped considerably. In fact, we now pay $1,400 to get a genome sequence done, okay? So that's not very expensive. Probably a lot of you in this room can afford that, uh, you know, this week if I asked you to write a check. Not that I am. So the point out of all this is that it's not very expensive to actually get your genome sequence. Mind you, the interpretation of that sequence is not $1,400. The way we do it, it costs about $15,000 or more. And that's because um, we still don't understand the genome very well. We're pouring over all the, um, they're called variants, the changes in your DNA that might be associated with disease, and that's a very long, laborious process. There are automatic programs for being able to find some of this information, but a lot of it is still manual lookup the way we do it. So it's a long process. So if, um, and you can argue about the cost and what you get for, you know, there's some places that will do it for $10,000. Uh, I would argue they don't give you a very good interpretation, and maybe we're overkill. It, it really does cost us on the order of about $20,000 or so. Um, and we, we're kind of uh, very thorough, shall we say, the way we look up all the changes. Anyway, this is, um, but the nice thing is this is possible, and that number, by the way, is gonna go down considerably. Uh, it's plummeting quite rapidly. Anyway, because the cost of genome sequencing has plummeted so rapidly, uh, genome sequencing is actually now being used to understand and, and actually analyze and even treat a number of different diseases. So many of you may be familiar with this, that uh, genome sequencing is being used to try and understand cancer. So if you have cancer, uh, um, there's a, a decent chance you'll get either your whole genome or all your DNA or just uh, some of the key genes sequenced. Um, and quite frankly, this is gonna become standard of care in the near future, it already sort of is. So if, if you get cancer, the odds are you'll get your genome sequence to find genetic changes and try and find drugs that would basically treat um, those, that, that will respond based on the, the information you get from your genome. Uh, these days, genome sequencing is also being used to solve a lot of mystery diseases. So when kids are born, uh, not so much for autism because it's a more complex disease involving many genes, as we'll talk about, uh, but for a lot of genes, uh, kids are born and a single gene actually is responsible for a severe defect and you can sometimes find it. about 25% of the time you can find what's wrong with a child by actually sequencing their DNA. So that's worked pretty well and in fact you can even uh, get DNA sequenced before a child is born uh, because there's circulating DNA in the mother's blood for the fetus and you can actually sequence that DNA out of the mother's blood and determine the genome sequence. That leads to all kinds of issues that will be very interesting as a society for us to tackle. And we can talk about that one later, but that's getting beyond the scope of today's talk. We do a lot in this arena. We're very interested in sequencing healthy people's genome. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this uh, and a particular story that we've been doing because it's really set up the stage for the autism research that we're doing. So we actually do genome sequencing on healthy people to try and help manage their health. And specifically what we do is we sequence a person's DNA to try and predict the diseases they're at risk for, diagnose disease early, possibly uh, monitor disease states and treat them. And we actually even carry this many steps further. And again, this is the groundwork for the autism work. We in fact actually don't just sequence someone's DNA. We actually literally study as many molecules as possible in a person. So that is to say, we'll sample a person's blood and we'll literally make, um, let's see if I have this. We'll literally initially make uh, measure about 40,000 molecules. Now we literally make billions of measurements uh, of, in a person every time we sequence them. And what do we measure? We measure all their molecules, basically. We measure their RNA. 
We measure their proteins. We measure a very specific class of proteins that are important for modulating your immune system. We measure all the metabolites we can, 23,000 peaks, if you will. We measure the antibodies in a person's blood. And you may have heard about the microbiome, right? The, the, there are 10 times as many cells in and on you that aren't you than are you. Uh, that is to say, we have 100 trillion cells, but we have, sorry, we have 10 trillion cells that are us and 100 tr trillion cells that are bacteria. And we measure all these things uh, from a person, mostly from blood, some from urine. And this microbiome, we actually measure from your poop, your urine, nasal, tongue, and skin. So we actually measure it many places. And as a proof of principle, we initially did this on me. We've been profiling me for five years now, making lots of different measurements, measuring all these molecules, if you will. I'll show you where this is going. Uh, I don't have autism, but it will relate to the story I'm about to tell you. <laughs> Although some people think I have very strange behavior, so maybe um, I'm not so far off. Anyway, uh, we do profile me, so to speak, make these billions of measurements. We sample me quite frequently, every two to three months when I'm healthy. Uh, and when I get sick, we take many, many samples. And, and what we're trying to do is understand disease states and healthy states in a person and trying to see what changes go on when you get sick. And in my case, this actually turned out to be, it's kind of an incredible story, uh, because my genome predicted I was at risk for type 2 diabetes. I did not know this from my family history. I went from a 26% chance to a 47% chance of getting this in my lifetime. I, I won't explain all the details here. But the bottom line is um, uh, I was viewed as having a much higher risk of type 2 diabetes. And once you know it, during the course of the study, I actually got type 2 diabetes. So your genome can be used, we think, to predict disease. I'm not saying it works in every case, but we've actually now in several cases, use genome to help manage people's health care. In my case, it was to diagnose diabetes. In other cases, we, for example, discovered a woman who had a BRCA mutation with no family history of breast cancer. And that made her at very high risk for breast or ovarian cancer. So these are some of the things we're doing to try and understand, to try and see what's in a person's DNA to be able to manage their health. So anyway, in my case, we actually discovered um, it was kind of an interesting story because I got it right after a nasty viral infection. Uh, that it shot up. To make matters worse, I, it shot up, oops, and then I got it under control by actually changing my diet and exercising. But once you know it, it shot up again uh, about 18 months later. So actually, my glucose level is running very high these days. Running seems to be the only thing that keeps it down somewhat. Um, this is something called a hemoglobin A1C. It's a, it's a, a measure of high glucose uh, in a different way. So anyway, the bottom line is your genome can be used to predict disease, and then with that information, you can actually manage your health care. Now, what was powerful about our study was that uh, because we're measuring all these other molecules, we could really see changes going on in me, and we were, you'll see in a minute, we're doing this for 100 other people at incredible detail. So uh, this is a time during which I got diabetes. It's kind of complicated, but each row is a different molecule. And in green are all the molecules that went down when I got diabetes, and red are all the molecules that went up. And so we can see the biochemical pathways that change when you get a disease, okay? And so this, and, and we get a much clearer understanding, as, as I like to say, it's like getting an IMAX movie of what's going on when someone gets disease uh, as compared to, you know, what we do now, I'd argue medicine is kind of like fuzzy radio. It's very imprecise, it's very, uh, it's just not a very um, elegant way to do things. Now, mind you, this costs a lot of money to do this. So, there's, But I do think this is where the field is going. So we can see changes that occur when people get disease. We can see spikes of activity that change. Again, a level no one's done before. As I say, we're now rolling this out to about, study about 100 pre-diabetics and healthy people. Uh, and we're profiling them, if you will, for three years in incredible detail. Again, to try and see what happens when people get disease. So all this set up a nice framework for us to be able to try and understand by looking at lots of different molecules, how can we better understand disease states? And can we use this now to try and understand different diseases? And so um, we wanted to see if we could actually use some of the technology we've developed and some of the, um, if you will, approaches we've been thinking about to try and see if we can learn some new sites into autism. And so uh, this is really the work of a very talented postdoc called Jing Jing Li who basically uh, has been largely doing this entirely on his own with lots of advice, again, from Joachim Hallmeyer, who's here at Stanford, and Alex Urban, uh, who's also here at Stanford. 
And so um, to put this in the context, what people have been doing in autism, again, I told you there's a genetic component to autism, right? So um, what people have started doing, autism, it's known not to be a single gene because it's not like these breast cancer mutations where uh, they just segregate in a family you can follow this. It's thought to be due to combinations of genes or combinations of gene plus environment interactions. And that makes it very hard to find. So what people have been doing, they do something called um, genetic mapping. They're called GWAS studies where you can use markers to try and find uh, genetic links, if you will, to um, genetic loci that are contributing to the disease. And people have done this and they've studied tens of thousands of people and they can kind of get uh, maybe 10 genes they've identified this way. So it's been a very laborious, very difficult process. So with the, the DNA sequencing revolution, groups have come along and said, well, let's, the, the GWAS stuff, well, it kind of worked a little bit, not that well. Uh, let's see if we can start sequencing people's DNA, DNA of autistic kids and find things in common. So what they've been doing is they've been sequencing many cases of kids with autism, either uh, where there might be some evidence of, of familial disposition uh, and, and also then controls with kids who don't have autism and trying to see if they can find genetic changes that are enriched in the kids with autism relative to those that aren't. Okay, this has really been the goal. And once you find those changes, the goal is to try and find the, the rare changes. We call them variants in, in genetics. And you see what genes they lie in, and then you try and deduce the biological pathways. So people have started on this. Initially, they would study a few hundred people. Then they turned to a few thousand cases, literally large studies. Uh, um, so one that was done a few years ago, about the time we started our project, uh, maybe a little bit after, a uh, study was reported where they literally did sequencing of a thousand cases and almost a thousand controls to see if you can find any changes in the DNA the, the cases relative to the controls, okay? And if you can find those, you say, ah, oh, those are genes that are probably contributing to autism. And it was very unsatisfying. They found no clear-cut associations in this study. And in some other studies, might find one or two genes that they weren't so sure about. So they've now added on more. So the next study that came out had like 4,000 sequences, okay? So you add on more. And so uh, my own view on this is that this is like squeezing water out of a rock. These guys, uh, they just keep sequencing more and more with the hope of finding genes. And this is an approach that people are using for lots of complex diseases, autism, schizophrenia, uh, diabetes. The, uh, the groups doing this, they're, they're, not, they're finding some things, not very much, but they feel if they study more people, you have a better chance of finding the enrichment. Now, we found this very unsatisfying. This to us seemed like, well, squeezing water out of a rock. It's, you can do it, but it's just maybe not the best way to do this kind of work. So we took a step back, or I should say Jing Jing. And so let's, let's, look at, let's turn this on its head. Let's look at how biological processes and things and, and molecules are normally organized. And let's see if we can see a collection of those that are naturally working together and see whether those happen to be more likely mutated or changed in autistic kids. It's very abstract, but I think it'll be clearer in the next slide. So the, but it, it's the opposite. Instead of just sequencing and seeing what they have in common, it's, a, it's like seeing how things normally work together uh, to see this. And the best analogy I can do is this one shown here. Imagine the way the world's organized, right? We have 7 billion people, I guess, now in the world, and we have they're organized in the countries. And within each country, so for example, US, you have states or other places, provinces. And then within this, uh, here's, you have cities. Here's San Francisco, and here's its neighborhoods. And they're organized in the families and individual people and family, right? This is how people are organized. And they work together at some level in these different units. Well, proteins are kind of like people. So the entire collection of proteins is called the proteome, and there are um, at least 20,000 very different kinds, many as several hundred thousand when you count all the related types of proteins. So there, there's, say, 20,000 or so proteins. And you can see they kind of organize, uh, if you start looking at how they're organized, well, they can be organized into sort of collections of, say, 100 proteins that like to work together to replicate your DNA or maybe make your synapses fire, this sort of thing, or digest your food. Uh, and then you can look at them even further and see the exact biochemical complexes, which are made of, say, four or five different proteins, some of them more, some of them 100 
protein's the biggest ones. But um, so again, you can see the level at which these, and these would be things, again, the actual detailed biochemical activity. These are like families, if you will, over here. And this is kind of like maybe uh, San Francisco or something, okay? And another way to look at this is here, we're, we, this is the level we're looking at, where you have sort of 100 proteins that generally work together. And here's one diagram of this. This is actually set up by looking at the yeast cell. It's a model organism people study a lot. It has 6,000 proteins, and you can study it in incredible detail. And if you look at the organization at the level I've been describing, you can actually um, see what collections of proteins that are there. So, for example, there's a whole collection of, uh, say, 100 proteins that are involved in secreting proteins out of a cell. Again, these are sort of bio large biochemical processes. Uh, I mentioned this one before, replicating and repairing your DNA. That's another collection of proteins. So again, these are groups of proteins that like to work together to carry out a process. So what Jing Ying did in our group was he said, all right, let's take a look at all the proteins in a human cell. And this may get a little detailed. And let's look at how they're organized, okay, at that level. And he groups them into about 817 networks. And he uses a new algorithm that actually has been used in other fields uh, where you can look at networks of how people interact. In fact, that's where it comes from. It doesn't come from biochemistry at all. So it uh, comes from some other computer-savvy folks. And he basically takes, so other groups have actually looked at who likes to work with who by physically pulling them down and identifying different proteins. And he then reorganized them and said, all right, who likes, who, who, which proteins tend to work together? And again, he groups them into these 700, or, or, sorry, 817, we like to call them modules, okay? And then he says, all right, let's take genes that people have said are involved in autism. And there's a collection of favorite genes that have been put together. They're called the Safari genes, many of you who follow this field may be familiar with. And at the time, there were 383 genes in this database. So we said, all right, these are genes involved in autism. Let's see where they map onto this module, okay? Does this make sense to everybody? Okay, lots of heads nodding. Good, that's a good sign. All right, so anyway, um, he did that, and amazingly, two modules jumped out screaming, meaning these 383, they weren't scattered over all 817. They were lo a lot of them were localized here, okay, in this module. Famous module 13, maybe not such a lucky number for autism people, I suppose. Uh, and again, this is an incredibly good discovery, right? The, the, the probability of this is, uh, you know, infinitesimal of not being by, I mean, it's, it's not a, a random thing. It's, and there was another one that wasn't quite as strong. This one's involved in regulating your DNA, actually, transcribing genes. But this one, uh, well, it was a new one. It has a mixture that I'll tell you about now. So basically, we had the set of genes that somehow like to work together that are part of autism. Now, is this really an autism module? One concern is that, uh, and this will get into a little detail about how we do with science in general, but one concern is this is a very biased set of genes. These are genes people happen to find uh, because they happen to like them and study them. It's known to be a very biased set. But there are eight other studies out there, including that one I mentioned. Remember the one that had about 2,000 1, cases, 1,000 controls that people sequenced, and they couldn't find anything? We could take all of those studies and ask, are the cases more enriched for mutations in this module relative to the control? In every single case, they were. Okay. So that was pretty amazing. So these eight studies, including studies where people couldn't find anything in common, they all had higher frequency of changes in this set of proteins, okay? And so this is just four, but there are others. Um, and this gets a little technical, so I won't get into it. Some of these studies, three of them were done by, they're called copy number changes. You can have large chunks of your DNA changing and they affect lots of genes. But the affected genes, they will always be enriched for mutations in this module that we found. That module, by the way, I forgot to say, it has 119 genes, okay? So it's a, it's, uh, you know, a large number, but not an out of control number. And it's also kind of consistent with what you might think for autism. People think there's probably a few hundred genes involved in autism, okay? And then we can do it from the sequencing studies. And this is just one of those studies. Uh, again, with the, uh, they all had reasonable p 
p-values is what we, what we use in science to say this is significant. And this is not the best ones. This is actually a random set. If I show you the other four studies, they, are, they will have the same spectrum. So every single study shows enrichment for this module. So we said, aha, this must be involved in, in autism somehow. But just to be sure, we went out and sequenced 25 DNA from 25 autistic kids ourselves. Everyone in the field will tell you there's no chance this will work. You can't just sequence 25 people and find they're enriched for mutations in autism genes. It just doesn't happen. But sure enough, we sequenced 25 cases, a few controls to sequence for some of the technical aspects of the sequencing, and even this came out enriched for autism. That is to say, that tells you this is a very strong module, by the way, involved in autism. It means if you can, at very high frequency, sequence an autistic child and see with that they're likely to have mutations in this module. It's telling you that module is very likely to be involved in the disease. Does that all make sense so far? So I'm kind of pinning down how we discover these things. So now we have this module involved in autism. We say, all right, well, so what does it do? So the first thing you can do is um, see where it's expressed. So it's 119 genes. And what I'm going to tell you now is amazing because there's been groups of people over the years, this is the power of science, who've been characterizing all kinds of things, and they make their data public. And one of those projects is something called the Allen Brain Atlas. I don't know if you've heard of this one. But basically what they've done is they've, um, they've localized where thousands of genes are expressed, a lot of the neural genes in particular, where they express in 295 regions of the brain. Okay, and they, you do something called in situ hybridization. You can actually find out where all these genes are expressed. And they had actually localized then this 119 genes. This is our 119 genes. And there's ways to actually computationally say which genes tend to be expressed together and which ones aren't. It's called clustering. And the bottom line is each of these rows is a gene and each of these is a different region of the brain for 295 regions, okay? And so you can say, well, these, it turns out these fall into two patterns. I think you can see this, right? Two patterns in general, and of course we made them different colors to make it even easier. But one set of genes called group one, which has 56 genes, it turns out where they're expressed is where things are most red. And this set of genes tends to be expressed in a part of the brain called the corpus callosum, which I'll talk about in just a minute. The other part, group two, tends to be, it's a little bit of an artifact here, but this is actually in the hippocampus, but it's really in neural genes in general. It's more generally neuronal in its expression. Okay, so this set of genes is expressed in corpus callosum. So you're gonna say, well, what's the corpus callosum? Oh, I should say again. So this set of genes, group two, likes to be expressed in neurons. This one, these tend not to be neural genes. There's something called oligodendrocytes. I'll explain this in a minute. So what is the corpus callosum? Well, I had to learn all this myself, but Jing Jing luckily knew it all. So uh, it's actually the part that connects the two hemispheres of your brain, where your neurons go across and connect. And it's very, very important for communication, which, of course, is one important thing that many autistic kids have a problem with. Not only that, in many children with autism, it turns out they've done brain imaging in the corpus callosum tends to be smaller. Not all kids, but a subset have reduced corpus callosum. So in fact, this for the first time actually then really makes some molecular underpinnings for these brain observations that have been seen before. Okay, so to pin this down a little bit further, uh, the corpus callosum has these, these basically axons, if you will, from neurons. They come from one part of the brain, they project over to the other to make this communication. And it's covered by the myelin sheath, which actually uses oligodendrocytes uh, to support it. So these oligodendrocytes are kind of rampant, if you will, in the corpus callosum. They're not neural cells. They're a different kind of cells in your brain, okay? And so basically, um, when we first reported this, people said, well, of course that can't be right. Everybody knows autism involves neurons. It can't be uh, corpus callosum. So we had to convince them that in fact we had the right thing. We used many different ways to do this. When you find something new in science, I'm sure you've all learned this, everybody is a skeptic. And here's 100 reasons why it's wrong. We're actually going through one of these right now in another project. Um, so um, 
One thing you can do is, here's the amazing thing about science, you can use mouse models. And there's a huge amount of data already out there using mice as models for disease. They've made lots of mutants. They've knocked out lots of genes in the mouse. Uh, and they've also done very careful gene expression analysis better than that in humans. So you can use this information. So all of the genes we found, they all have orthologs, if you will, in the mouse. Meaning they have copies of, sorry, getting jargony. But they have, um, yeah, they have, um, well, similar genes in the mouse. I hope that was clear. Okay. And they have knockouts from most of those genes, it turns out already. And it turns out nearly all of them have neural defects. So that told us we were, again, on the right track. And that made a lot of sense. And we could also look at where the genes were expressed. And, and we can do this in two ways. One is we can simply see in the mouse, they've actually looked at incredible detail when all genes have been expressed and in what parts of the brain. Again, a much le better level than they've done in humans. And this gets very complicated, but these are the different cell types. You can see where things are expressed. And the bottom line is these genes here tend to be group one genes. These genes here tend to be group two genes. These are the oligodendrocytes. Remember those same kinds of cells I was telling you before. Uh, and these group two genes, I hope I said that right, these group two genes tend to be more neuronal cells again. And the other cool thing that came out of this is when are these expressed? They're almost always expressed early in the fetus. Again, which is a time when autism is thought to be manifesting itself. So it's all kind of coming together, if you will. All right. Just to carry things even further, we can do a certain staining. In fact, I think this was done in this very building here, where they actually stained for one of the genes we found frequently mutated in our particular set of those 25 patients. Uh, and we looked at where they're staining, and sure enough, they're actually staining these are oligodendrocytes. They're, in fact, staining. So we're, again, on the right track here. All right. Um, we went on and did other kinds of expression experiments to really pin this down. We also showed there's mouse mutants that don't make oligodendrocytes, and those group 1 genes aren't expressed as well. So you can use all this other data that's out there. All right. Lastly, and this, these samples are very hard to come by, uh, but fortunate we were able to get them from Autism Speaks. Basically, um, we were able to get six match case controls, meaning similar ages, similar sex of, of normal and autistic kids in six cases. We could say, well, are those 119 genes, are they misexpressed in the autism kids relative to the controls, the non-autistic ones? And the answer is they are. So they have uh, a much higher misexpression, if you will. That's what this one says in the module relative to just genes in general, even synaptic genes. These aren't just, they are enriched in synaptic genes, I should point out, but they're not. They're a special class. OK. So why is all this important? Well, what it says is that we can use a systems analysis. If we just looked at genetics, we never would have found this. It's really by being able to look at the natural organization. We use proteins. We use RNA expression. Using all this information, we can really gain some new insights into autism itself. And we can validate this, again, using all the sequencing study out there. And this is really a great lesson in data sharing. I'd say 90% of the data was already out there. And so we just had to go in and mine around and look at it and reorganize it. Uh, and then we validated it by generating our own data. And it shows the power of share sharing in science, I would say. It's because people had shared this data, we could do what we did. And we actually did it fairly quickly. Of course, you need a brilliant postdoc, too. That helps. OK. All right. And then the other thing we learned is because we took an unbiased approach, we didn't ask, tell, you know, we're not going to look in neurons and try and figure out where this thing is. We let the data tell us what was going on. And basically what it said is that, in fact, the corpus callosum is clearly a key, key area that's involved in this disease. And I don't think we would have found this again by, uh, if you already have the hypothesis neurons, you won't look in the corpus callosum. So we have the data tell us. That's the power of these unbiased approaches. Although it's not just the corpus callosum. The other was already known. It's the neuro cells. And then also it implicates a whole new set of cells involved in autism people really haven't been following. These are oligodendrocytes, which we think are pretty important. And I won't say we're the only group to see this now. Other groups are starting to pop out and actually see similar things. But I can tell you it's very hard to get this published initially because it was viewed very skeptically. All right. So what is next? Well, so I think this is very interesting because it does give us some basic information of what's going on in autism, that communication between the hemispheres is probably an important part of the disease. And there are groups that are trying to work on drugs that will target specific neurons, like the long 
projected um, neurons that uh, would be the sort that would actually project across the, um, the two hemispheres. So if you can envision a case where you can identify kids who might have uh, more defects in that area and there are drugs that are targeting these, this is a wish list, so don't get me wrong, but you can envision that this might help such kids. Uh, to me, what I think we're pretty good at is trying to predict things. So what we want to do ultimately is trying to use you know, I envision a world where people are going to get their kids sequenced before they're born. Uh, and we already know when you are born, you get about 60 things tested for automatically, PKU, things like that. That's standard stuff. But soon it'll be done genetically, at least in addition to those biochemical tests that are happening. And I actually think a lot of it will happen before kids are born. And, and if we have good, strong signatures, uh, we should be able to better predict which ones might tell someone they're more likely to be autistic. And I don't think it's just going to be the genome sequencing, but I think genome sequencing, and it'll be probabilistic too, don't get me wrong. It's not going to be that we can tell exactly by, you know, these kind of variants that this kid's going to be autistic and that one's not. I think what you'll see is that, well, this person has a, much like me and my diabetes, taking back to that part, of a much greater chance of being, having diabetes based on my genome. Mine, mine's a classic case. I had a, uh, my genome we think has me predisposed for diabetes and the viral infection actually that came along triggered the disease. That's what we think happened for me. I predict that that kind of thing could happen in autism as well. I'm not saying it always does. Some of it may be purely genetic, some of it may be purely environmental, but I can envision scenarios where you're genetically predisposed for a complex disease and environmental stimulus actually triggers it. So that's how we see. So I would, I would envision, um, us being able to sequence someone's DNA and say, well, your child has a 20-fold risk for increased autism. Let's start looking at that early. Let's not wait till they're four years old. Let's wait till they're born and then start running whatever tests we need to do this stuff. And I think this is, I think, just the start of this. Oh, this just says what I said. Again, getting your genome sequenced before birth. I think that we'll be adding lots of other kinds of data of the sort we're doing for diabetes as well. I don't think we'll be measuring 60 things at birth anymore either. I think we'll be measuring thousands of things in the future uh, along the lines we were doing earlier to be able to man manage people's health. But the other thing I can envision us doing is trying to learn more about autism by crowdsourcing. This is a project that we're actually doing with Dennis Wall. He's actually, again, he's the one I mentioned doing the video of kids. I didn't know how long this first time I've given this longer version of the talk, and I actually have some of those videos I'll show you, if you since we'll have time. Uh, but basically, um, what he's doing, he wants to be able to collect information from people, uh, basically videos, and try and use that to predict autism. And so he's collecting it, and I hope I have the web address. I can't remember if I remember to put it up there, but if not, I'll get it to you somehow. Um, but basically, he's trying to um, have people send in videos along with microbiome. He wants to actually look at the microbiome contribution to this uh, disease. And what we want to do is actually thinking about autism as a very complex disease. Uh, again, I mentioned at the beginning that some, there are all kinds of different behaviors associated with autism. I think omics is perfect and genomics is perfect for substratifying the disease. That is to say, I think autism is probably a hundred different diseases. And so I think we should be subclassifying it accordingly so we can treat it accordingly. And so I think by, by cataloging the behaviors better, along with whatever morphological characteristics we might be able to do. So for example, I mentioned earlier, some kids have big heads, some have little heads associated with autism at a non-random frequency relative to the normal population. I think there will be other behavioral aspects. And I think if we can collect all this information, will be able to uh, better understand the disease. And so the model we're going to try is crowdsourcing, meaning, so right now, what you can do, the, the first version of this has the, the video and the microbiome, but what I want to do is collect lots of other information. And so what that's going to mean is um, people will send in, you know, measurements and behavioral aspects, some of which could be collected from video, and we'll be able to better, uh, again, get lots of information, let the data tell us how many different classes of autism there are, and there'll probably be classes and subclasses, and then try and better understand the disease. That's how I'd like to see it go.
So these are the people in my lab who did the work. Jing Jing Li is really the lead, but we had help from many, many other folks. Uh, I didn't talk about that work today, but especially Joachim Hallmeyer and Alex Urban. And if you want, oh yeah. So first of all, I'm gonna make a shameless plug. Uh, our department has just launched a new course in genetics and genomics. So if you're interested in this whole general space about genetics and sequencing, so we have this course, it gives fundamentals of genetics. It also talks about personalized medicine and such. And you can actually, uh, um, there's courses on cancer genomics and personalized medicine and uh, even biotechnology, all kinds of genetics aspects. It's, and it's meant for people like you who are very interested in this general area. So uh, yes, I have, I think I brought some cards. I hope I remembered to. Um, I probably have some, okay? So anyway, you can learn more about this area. So I'll just show you if this works. So this is uh, um, two kids that they film. Uh, this is, comes from Dennis's work. Uh, so again, one on the left and one on the right. And they simply, these, I think these, I don't know for sure these are shot with an iPhone, but in general you can do this with an iPhone just for five minutes. And what's special about this is they run some autism behavior tests, they take 17 hours. He takes a five minute video, he has a machine learning, again this is a little complicated maybe, but basically it's a machine learning algorithm that in five minutes can actually look at this and make some probabilistic prediction of whether they're more likely to be autistic or not. So from a five minute video of these two kids, he basically makes this prediction, and this one it turns out is 78% uh, on his score, predicted to be a high risk, and this one is, gets a 24 score, and that's the accuracy of his test from a five minute video, and it's so much faster. So this is the kind of information, again, I think this is where, I think it's a new approach, and I think bringing this with other kinds of approaches, including genetics, I hope will really tell us a lot more about this disease, and maybe ultimately, not only just what we can learn about it, but maybe how we can better treat it. So I think I'm ending ridiculously early here. I don't know if that's okay, but I guess I get 12 more minutes of questions, so. Uh, good evening. I work at a community college and I work with a lot of students with autism. It seems like a much higher uh, rate of males versus females. Do you have any of those statistics? Yeah, um, it, it is much higher male than female. I've forgotten the numbers, something like five to one. So there, in, there are many possible explanations for that. Some, I think it may be X-linked, but it may be more hormonal or something like that. There, it's not clear, but it's a great observation. Just regarding the uh, the video um, assessment here that you spoke about at the end, how young of children can you evaluate that way? Yeah, I think he's going under two years, so as young as uh, 18 months or so, so quite young. And in fact, I think he prefers to get them before two years old. In fact. And that's the ultimate goal to get, again, as early as possible. This is a bit off the subject, but in regard to established cases of autism, seven, eight, ten pe people older, what do you see as possible future treatment? Oh, well, that's a great question. And here you're probably out of my league. So, uh, my senses are, again, depending on, the more severe kids, quite frankly, uh, you, it's very difficult to treat them even at an early age. Uh, but the more milder ones, obviously, you have the best success for it. So uh, I know there are improvements for kids who, even in their teenagers, can do somewhat better. Um, but it does require, my understanding, a lot of work on the parents' part and others. Um, that, I don't know how well that's worked. Um, probably for certain aspects of the disease, but I wouldn't say for, um, as a general, it's certainly not a therapy. When you talk to clinical psychologists about your findings, does the light bulb go on and they go, oh yeah, it's obvious that part of the problem is a connection between the two halves? Or they scratch their head and say, boy, we didn't see that coming at all? Um, I think some say 
it depends on their bias. <laughs> so some say, of course, yes, that makes a lot of sense. Yes, communication between, uh, I could have told you that five years ago. You don't have to do all that work. And others say, you're you know, absolutely wrong. You need to go back and do some more work. <laughs> so I think there are, it, it's, there's just a strong bias towards the neuronal component. And it's just the way the field evolved, I think. So I think those who, depending how they're trained, and I can tell you the neurobiologists in general have been the least receptive to this area. They've really dug into the whole cortical neuron uh, thing, and they're not looking for a broader vision on this. As a general rule, there are exceptions. I think that's slightly easing up. But, so the clinical psychologists there, I mean, it, yeah, I think they probably been more receptive as a group on the whole. But you know, everybody has their biases. I was wondering what is going to I mean, uh, increase the possibility of a parent having these tests run on their children, either a video or a genetic test. Why would they do it? You know, most parents say, well, you know, I'm not going to worry about it until there's a real evidence of a problem. So well, that's the why problem. are we going to do I it think, early? <laughs> yeah, I think the problem is by the time it's seen in most cases, it, the effects you can have by behavior modification are very limited. And that's the fundamental problem. And backing up and thinking about it, you realize early on in life they do hearing tests, right? Right off the bat. They do vision tests. They do lots of tests for kids, but they don't test for autism. So if you think about it, in my mind, it should be a routine test, that it should be the same as a biochemical test you get at birth, that with a five-minute video, I'm not saying uh, Dennis's is the perfect video. I know he'd like to improve it. but. If it tells you something you didn't otherwise know, it would be better to learn that right away and then start working with your child uh, to see what you might be able to do. Again, I think in the, most people tell you in the most severe cases, it may be very difficult to have much effect. But certainly in the very mild cases, there's a lot, again, it's a whole spectrum, autism spectrum disorder. In the mild cases, uh, it's very clear you can have an incredible uh, um, effect. And so I think if we can move everything to the early stage, at least we'll have a chance with a large population of kids. Remember, this is one in 68 kids, and there are 4 million kids born each year. That's a lot of kids with autism. So Mike, you had uh, talked about the environmental component and the sort of the mysteries around that. So I have two questions related to that. One is, we know the environment interacts with our DNA through methylation um, to some degree. And so have you looked at these modules and the state of their methylation changes? And maybe you can explain to the audience what methylation is. Yeah. And then my second question is, there's this study being done on the microbiome with relationship to, to autism. And that's another way that your body interacts with the environment with the microbiome being the, the interface um, what, what do you know about the microbiome related to autism? Yeah, that's a great question. So in the first case, and I forgot to mention this, we're very interested, so what Chris is mentioning is that um, your DNA can get modified and even it can get chemically modified by something called methylation. And it can also get um, changed in a way, the way it's packaged, so it can be changed its gene, the expression of genes. And this is called epigenetics, many of you have heard this term before. And so um, basically that can be influenced by lots of things. It can be influenced by your age. In fact, you can tell someone's age exactly by their methylation pattern on 353 sites in their DNA. And I can tell you it really works because when we did my DNA methylation pattern, I was sure I had the methylation of a 25-year-old, but uh-uh, smack on within a year. So, um, and I'm not 25, I can tell you that. <laughs> Okay. So, in fact, it really does work. It also is influenced by your nutrition, uh, exercise, things like this. And so one, in fact, very fascinating study, I'll just throw this out because this will get you thinking. There's a very in nice Scandinavian study where they had folks riding a bicycle, pumping with one leg. And they would pump for 45 minutes a day for four days a week. And after three months, they measured their, their change in their DNA in the exercise versus the non-exercise leg. And in fact, they're this methylation pattern changed. So you can change the activity of your DNA through the things you do. So exercise, everything influences your DNA. And again, aging, we still have to figure out how to reverse that one. 
better work on that soon. Anyway, the point out of all this is that it, it does influence, and so people really do like the idea that viral infections, or I certainly do, or toxins or things might affect your DNA. And so one area that we say, I actually think the environmental influence on your DNA may be bigger than the genetic influence. So I actually want to not only study the genetics, we want to do this epigenetics, this, this methylation, and also this change in packaging called chromatin changes. So those are the things that we really want to pursue. So I'm glad you raised that because actually that will be another huge area of research for our lab as well. So I think, so again, we think the things you're exposed to can affect it. And it may not all happen at the DNA level too. Some of this can happen at levels that are different from your DNA. Um, your lipids and other things, it's possible as well. And that is completely un not understood. You asked a second question, I forgot what it was because I gave such a long answer to the first one. Microbiome. Oh, the microbiome. So there's studies out there linking the microbiome to autism. It's, it's really not clear yet what's cause and effect. Um, in the case of, so the microbiome has been really strongly linked to many diseases. Some of those diseases are things like inflammatory bowel disease and colitis. There it's very, very clear. Diabetes and obesity or other are very clear links. And even heart attacks have been linked at some level to your microbiome. So there's a chemical that's actually produced by your microbiome that's, when its levels are elevated, it's thought to be associated with a higher chance of heart attacks. So um, those are very clear. But the microbiome is probably linked with every other disease you can imagine. And there, again, what's cause and effect isn't so clear. It's not unreasonable to think your microbiome is you know, having some influence on disease because it makes zillions of chemicals that probably many of which are neural modulators, if you will. So it's reasonable to think that your microbiome should have an effect on your behavior and other things. And I can tell you it changes dramatically when you get sick. We've looked at mine quite extensively. So I do think this will um, uh, have a big area, but again, the whole cause and effect. So it's a very fascinating one. This is the one Dennis wants to explore through this crowdsourcing thing. So that's going to be one of the key aspects of this project. So these are both great questions. I'm not sure who is next. You might have been next. I have the mic. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> that'll, that'll do it every time. The accuracy of the testing here is uh, phenomenal. But it raises the question, how much of it is the algorithm and therefore could be spread to other practitioners with accuracy, no pun intended, yeah. how much of it is art based on the skills of the gentleman of reviewing the films, which would not likely be consistently distributed to other practitioners giving the test. So it's kind of art versus the value of the algorithm in this and its repeatability yeah. as you went to larger uh, people offering the exams. Right. What I don't know is how many times this has been repeated independently, although I know he's done it on many individuals. So I think the reproducibility we still need to see, but uh, and he sh you should probably bring him in for one of these talks. I think he'll show more of these. So I, I think that's a great question. The algorithm itself is fairly robust. That is, it was trained on certain parameters like, you know, frequency of gaze and uh, how much the attention, and they look at where the eyes are focusing and things like this. So there's a series of parameters that he's pulled out that the algorithm is, is weighing. You know, each of these carries a certain weight to be carried that way. Now, how much the video, like how you take the video, influences that algorithm, I don't. So I think the algorithm itself is robust. How much the video information you collect uh, influences that final decision, I don't know. My understanding from talking with him is is quite robust because you get a lot of measurements in five minutes. Now, you know, if you do it from 400 feet away, maybe it's not so good, but um, you get the point. So I don't know all the details, but my understanding, and it's all done, a lot of it's done with an iPhone or can be done with an iPhone. So I, that tells you it doesn't have to be uh, super high resolution anyway. So I, 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 So I think it looks incredibly exciting. I mean, it's a great question. So I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you need a microphone because I think they're trying to record this. So if we could. Sorry about that. Uh, has there been an effort to search the world's populations to find those that may have a low incidence of autism? That's a great question, and I don't know the answer to that. How much of that is because of undiagnosis versus... Uh, 
a really true low frequency? It's a great question. And well, I we have a lot of toxins and so on in our society, and there's got to be those little pockets where they haven't been, had that. They don't have that. Uh -huh. And to look at that, those populations would be interesting. Yeah, they sure would. And there's a big effort in general to find people who are resilient to certain diseases, who have genetic predisposition for certain diseases, but don't have those diseases. And so there's a lot of interest in that. So I think what you just said would be incredibly interesting. So I, here's where you're out of my area of expertise. Again, I'm still fairly new to this. I imagine that is known better. It's just not known to me. Hi. First, I would like to apologize for creating micro disturbances in this area. My uh, baby's tutor canceled at the last minute, and it was too good to miss. Uh, I have my three-year-old daughter here, which is what I was referring to. So I had a question regarding the, uh, the results that you presented. So the cohort that you're working with was mostly European. Right. So do you think, how would your studies translate to other ethnicities and even other geographic? This is a great question, and I think this is a problem with a lot of studies that exist now. That is, they tend to be focused on Europeans. And that is definitely the case for the autism studies. Most of those are European-centric. And um, they are attempting to broaden this, including in the area of autism, uh, but those studies are only rolling out now. On the positive side, there is a big push to include more diverse populations. Uh, and it's also getting incredibly cheaper. So all the work that's been done before, even though it's a lot of work, it'll be trivial to what's going to come out soon. <laughs> so I think we can correct up for what I see as a gross, uh, you know, insufficiency in, st in not studying these other populations. And I think that needs to be corrected. So I'm 100% with you. Uh, some areas are getting further ahead, like in Japan. There's all kinds of different... Uh, sequencing studies going on, and same with China. And so I think you're going to see the Asian groups get studied quickly. And the NIH is very, very interested in this health, it's called health disparities, and making sure that underrepresented populations in particular get included. And so I, I think you will see things, you know, get better for the future, I hope. So it's a great question, though. I will say I do know that some of these tests, like the video tests I said, actually does, has been used on other populations and seems to work. So. Uh, at least that one's out there broader. Any more questions? For our next Cafe Side, July 23rd, we're going to change subject matters. We're going to have the director of Stanford Athletics, Bernard Muir, speak about successes in Stanford Athletics and future challenges. I just want to thank Professor Snyder for a wonderful talk and great research. Thank you. Thank you for having me. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.